And just real quick, I've been doing real estate since about uh, 2004. Went through the crash, came back out, and kind of my motto is survivability of all this stuff. Because these things go up and down, up and down all the time. The main goal you want to have here is to survive to get through to the next cycle because there's going to be a downturn and there's going to be an upswing. So, what I'm talking about tonight is land trust. Um, they, I got introduced to them back in 2004 and I've learned a lot the hard way and I've kind of narrowed this thing down and gotten it, uh, I won't say perfect, and just a disclaimer real quick, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA, I'm not giving legal advice or accounting <laughs> advice, okay? Just know that anything that you do from out of this information, you need to consult your own attorneys and CPAs before you do any of that. Um, so I got started in this just to keep myself safe. Um, I'm not a, a good renter landlord. I don't deal with uh, human trauma very easily. Um, so that never did really suit and fit me. So I got into the owner financing world and lease options and stuff like that. So this fit very well for what I was doing and it, and it works very well in the rental side of it as well. In fact, it's better for the rental side. I just don't have the personality for it. So let me kind of go over some benefits of a land trust just to kind of get us started. I'm going to try to stay real basic. If you do have a question, don't fear about raising your hand and stopping. If I go too fast through something, I'm going to try to get through this so I can get down to the meat and potatoes and give you some time to ask questions. One of the biggest benefits of land trust is the privacy of ownership. Once you place a, a property into land trust, it is no longer your piece of property. And that's your saving grace, is you don't want it in your name. It becomes a trust all by itself, an entity. It sits over here and can, has its own set of rules so that when you tell somebody that hasn't paid their rent that the trust wants their money, you can actually mean that. And it's not you that's collecting the rent, you're doing it for the trust. So it puts you in a little bit different position. Um, also, this is how we record public record is through the land trust. So when you take it out of your name, instead of, if anybody in here owned property, I can find it. So if I'm a litigant and I'm trying to sue you, all I got to do is let my attorney loose on the internet and we'll find your name and we'll find out everything you've got and then we know how to sue you. If you switch over to land trust and put these in land trust, that's no longer a problem because you don't own any property anymore. So suing you is not any fun and it's not very profitable anymore. Uh, the other thing that this does is avoids probate. So if you pass away and die and you didn't leave a will, if you set these land trusts up properly, it automatically, just like an insurance policy would transfer once you die, your property would transfer to your beneficiaries. There's no limit on what you can do with beneficiaries. You can use other trusts as beneficiaries. You can do five children as beneficiaries and split them up into each different sections. So you can um, curtail that to anything that fits your needs. I know I have six kids total and two grandchildren, so it's a nightmare a will that could change you know in the next year so with a beneficial interest i can draw up it's christmas time or thanksgiving when things get a little hairy and just go i wrote you out and i didn't have to pay an attorney gets their attention <laughs> um ease of transferability um we're always used to have to go to an attorney with a contract and have them to close it and do a title search and make all these copies and certify this and courier over that, and usually we end up spending $1,500 to $2,500 every time we transfer a piece of property somewhere. With a land trust, that's it. I can sell it. Gone. Over with. Now, you would want to get a title check and title insurance to be sure you're getting a clear title. But that's all it would take. So we just, and, and about the time that I can type that up and sign it, is how long it takes. So there's no more waiting on attorneys, title checks, any of that stuff. Um, the other thing that this does really for us now is the avoidance of the dual sale clause. Does everybody know what the dual sale clause is? Anybody doesn't know what the dual sale clause is? I don't. You don't know what, who said that? I don't. You don't, okay. <laughs> so on all the loans now since 1979, I think, um, that's when they came in and gave the banks permission 
to put a due on sale clause where if there's any transfer on the name of that property, any sale of any kind, the bank can come in and call that uh, loan due within 30 days. They can just say, we want to be paid off, you made us a transfer, we want to be paid off. So that puts you in a precarious spot if you're in foreclosure or if an investor is trying to work a deal where he can go in and take a lot of subject to purchases. Once that happens, they will, I've never seen it happen, but they could show up and so we want to be paid off. So what this does is this takes that off of, well, let me back up there. The St. Germain Act, which is what the dual sale clause was put into place, actually has a stipulation that says your, um, I'm not looking for the word now, but you're prohibited from the dual sale clause being enacted if it has been put into a trust for estate planning purposes. So if you've placed your property into a trust for estate planning purposes, they cannot call the dual sale clause. It would be illegal. So that's a winner on our, that's a checkbox for us. Um, it just avoids it completely. There's, it can't come back up again after that. Um, judgments against beneficiaries do not attach to property. Now the banks are starting to catch on to this too. They used to really frown on people putting property into land trust because they didn't understand it. But actually now, when it's put into a land trust, if the bank was to get in trouble and become insolvent for some reason, it wouldn't affect the, the property at all. If the homeowner got sued and lost everything they had or had an IRS tax lien, it won't attach to the property because it's in a trust. It's no longer in the owner's name. So it detaches all of that um, attachment that they can put onto properties. And then, so that's good for a seller and for a buyer. So one of the things you can tell people if you're doing a subject to is, look, we're going to put this thing in a land trust and anything that happens to you from here forward won't affect this property. And anything that happens to me won't affect this property. This property is going to sit over here all by itself and be protected. So the only thing that really happen is whatever happens on the property. Am I going too fast? Okay. I'm trying to get through this beneficial part of it. <laughs> No cost upon transferring the beneficiaries. If you want to change beneficiaries, you don't have to call an attorney. If you want to put it in a land trust as a beneficiary, you don't have to call an attorney. You just go in and write it up and make it, put it in the file and, not, and note it, and on you go. You've changed it right there. Um, there's no registered agent needed. Uh, how many people have LLCs? Yeah, I have one too. <laughs> That's registered with the state. You can look those up. You can find out who owns them or who's registered as the owner, and then you can head into that direction. You know where to start looking. Um, with these, nothing goes on record except for the deed itself and anything that you might post after that. Um, legal and equitable title will be in the trustee's name. So whoever you, man, we're gonna go through some characters here in a minute. So I'll help you understand that a little better. But whoever you decide to be your trustee, and you'll need to think about that kind of importantly, because they all of a sudden have legal and equitable interest in your house. They can determine where, it, where, where it's sold, not determined. They actually do the signing. You do the determining. And there's a direction for the land trust, for the trustee, that you fill out to tell them what to do. Anything that they do on their own would be fraud. So you're protected in the courts and when, if you ever have this come up and you have a trustee, actually the less they know the better about the whole transaction. They're really just your third party that signs forms for you and, and gets the mail if, the, if you so choose. That's really all they are. Uh, also on this fact, trustees have no personal liability whatsoever. As long as they don't do anything other than what you tell them to do, Actually, if, if this um, house land trust were to borrow money from a bank, which it can, the trustee would sign the mortgage on behalf of the trust. So they're not on the hook if things go bad. It's just that they are the signing party. They are the legal entity for the land trust. I mean, but if you are the signing entity, can you be both? You don't want to be both. Yeah, but then you would be liable. Then you would, yes. 
You're saying both as in the beneficiary and the trustee? Yes. Yeah, you want have somebody independent. Right. You want somebody independent that is not that arms you want to create that arm's length. And that's what that does. An attorney or accountant? You could use an attorney or an accountant or really anybody. Uh, the stupider the better, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, uh, it also keeps your sales price um, private. How many people have looked up to see what somebody made on a house? How many people have had the seller show up at closing and go, you're making how much off my house? I didn't pay anything and you made $8,000? What are you doing? This keeps that private. So there's another payday. And all of a sudden, they don't have a clue what's going on because they can't follow the pattern. I mean, I guess if they stood beside you the whole time you're doing this, they might have figured it out. But other than that, they're really not going to be able to figure it out. And here's my favorite. 1099 is not required for ben beneficial interest transfers. Since the sale of the beneficial interest in a land trust is selling personal property, not real property, the requirement to file a 1099 does not apply. So if you sold a boat or a gun or a stack of wood out of your backyard, would you report that on your taxes? So if you sell a land, if you sell a piece of property in a land trust and you sell the beneficial interest of that land trust, you just sold a piece of personal property. There's no tax attached to that. You don't report it to anybody, it just goes in your hip. Can they, can they easily, um, I mean, so you're, you're signing over control of the trust to somebody. Right. Can they then wind that down easily by then putting in their personal name? And Absolutely. They could sell, they could transfer it from the trust to their own name if they wanted to. And honestly, that doesn't cost that much money, but it would have to go an attorney to do that, to get that done. And I leave that to other people if they want to do that. Um, I always tell people when I sell a property, I'll pay the closing cost. How much is that piece of paper? And that's about what that cost. And then if they want to go do that, they, they're very welcome to do that. But um, now I've got it done and over with and we're out of my parking lot. Um, there's no recordation of the trust agreement. So what I'm going to show you here in a few minutes is an actual trust. And so all of these documents that tell us what to do and how this behaves are not on public record. There's nowhere that you go to record this like you do an operating statement for uh, LLC. When you record one of those, it's out there for the whole world to take a shot at. Whereas in these, all that's kept private and behind your veil. Also, this helps keep your title clear of defects. Because anything the owner does, or the seller, let's say, on the property doesn't attach to the, um, the deed, and nothing you do attaches to the deed, it keeps that title clear. So you're really not worried about selling this thing as long as the taxes have been paid and nothing's happened on the property. You're pretty confident that you're, you're giving away a clear title again when you sell it. Okay, so I got, those are the most of the benefits. There are some more, but it gets a little more complicated and these things just continue to dive down into a rabbit hole. So I tried to stay pretty simple with those. Any questions before I kind of leave that? Go ahead. Does it have its own EIN number? You can get an EIN number and, if, and especially if you're going to buy subject to, you do need an EIN number to do that because the IRS is going to track that. Now the IRS tracking your money on a subject to is different from tracking for taxes so they can find out how much money you're making. But yes, it's very easy to apply for EIN. You can do it in two seconds online. You just go in and type out the information, bam, it's done. But you don't have to have it. You, you don't can... have to have one, no. And also, uh, land trusts don't file taxes. Okay. These are pass-through trusts. Okay. So anything that happens on the proceeds or avails of a trust passes through to the owner or owners, which would be the beneficiaries. So if you're the beneficiary of the land trust as a sole beneficiary and you made $10,000 rent on this, that would come straight through to your personal taxes. But if you had a partner and you were in 50-50, then you would split all that up 50-50. Also, the depreciation does the same thing. So all this stuff pays off on your taxes at the end. And does a trustee have to be an individual? Yes, and they have to be over 18. They have to be able to sign a deed okay. with legal authority. 
But it can't be like a corporation or anything like that. They actually have to be. They a, actually have to be a person that they could serve, or if they needed to. Or entity. No, not an no. entity okay. only trustee. Okay. Your beneficiary could be an entity, and we'll show you that in a minute. Okay. Now, if they get in trouble, though, are they subject to? If your trustee has a judgment, then is your property? They can arrest your trustee, and it still doesn't change anything with your property. Okay. And that's why you want the trustee not to be the beneficiary. That is exactly right. Gotcha. That's exactly right. The trustee is like a manager, am I right? That's right. Manager of the property. He's not even a manager. He's just kind of the guy that signs papers. <laughs> um, so in case you have a managed company, that management company could be your trustee, am I right? No, not necessarily. What you're really going to want to do, and I'll show you this in a minute, is put yourself as the manager. Okay. Hire yourself, and there's a document in here where you draw up a management agreement with yourself. And so all of a sudden, your piece of property that you've been out there trying to work on with these people, and you just go to them and say, look, I sold the property. And these guys that took it over is a trust. And, but they've agreed to keep me on as the property manager. So I really need you guys to pay your rent so I can keep my job. <laughs> because they're going to fire me if we don't. I told them you guys have been paying on time, and so let's see what we can do about that. And so it puts you in a different position. All of a sudden, you're on their level instead of this mean landlord that's ripping them off because they can't pay their rent. That's but, the, it. but the trustee could, like you said, sign a mortgage on your house. Yep. On the, or on that property. Right. They can also sell your property. Right. And if they did it without your direction, you know, that's fraud. Okay. Now, we have some ways to stop that. There's some breaks that keep that from happening. Okay. So if I knew about it, I wouldn't let you do it unless you had those breaks put in place to where they couldn't just go off rogue and sell it. And their name would be a public record. Their name is on public record. I've got one here to show. Brought with me. <laughs> so, now let's talk about a typical lawsuit. Has anybody ever been sued? <laughs> if you've been sued, that's exactly what you look at. Oh my God. So, the reason I wanted to talk about a lawsuit is to tell you what it takes to get through one of these things. And for those of you, this is a trust. Okay? This is called the Native American Education Trust. And you can name trust anything you want to name. You can name them the Star Wars Enterprise. You can name them whatever. C763 Jones Street. It really doesn't matter what you call it because there's no copyright on this thing. There's no, you could call it the Pepsi whatever. There's no, none of that details this. So you, the naming of it, to me, naming the trust and trustees are my hardest part. I try to sit down and write out 100 names at the time just because I'm on that thought process. But sometimes I, I, I get out of control with it. Um, so let's talk about a lawsuit because we want to let you know what it takes to get inside this envelope. Because this envelope is sealed to the public. You, you can't, you have to dig your way into this. The only thing that you see on public record, this is the warranty deed. And on it, it says that the warranty deed, Sally R. Dixon and Richard M. Dixon, sold this property to the Native American Education Trust and J.D. Goodguy as trustee. That's it. That's all the identification that's on here. And that's all you'll ever see. Now, does anybody know J.D. Goodguy? No. Do you know, did I tell you where he lived? <laughs> No, he could be in England or anywhere. And so that's that's all that's on public records, guys. Do you have an electronic signature? Do you have to fly over no. to England? <laughs> Anything that a, that a title company will take or the recorder's office will take. Okay. Um, so is this, is, just to be clear, that's not a fictitious name. Is it? This one actually is oh, okay. a fictitious name. Most of these are. Except the last beneficiary on this is me. At the bottom of the line, the pile is my name. And so this could be anybody's name, but you're normally only going to see initials. And so finding these people is not just picking up the phone book anymore and saying, well, here's J.D. Good Guy. I'm sure if that was a real name, they're everywhere. There might be even a good guy out there. I don't know. <laughs> but let's get back to the lawsuits real quick because I want, to, I want you to understand the importance of why this is in this bag. So in a typical lawsuit, how am I doing for time? You have to keep me posted. Okay. We're doing all right. 
on a typical lawsuit, the first thing that has to happen is you have to find somebody to complain about. So if a landlord falls and breaks their leg and they decide, I want to sue my landlord, the attorney's got to find out, all right, who owns this thing? Who, who do we got to go after? And so they're going to go over here to the warranty deed and go say, well, we've got a, this trust to deal with, the Native American Education Trust, and J.D. Good Guy is the guy we need to find. So they're going to go off and search for J.D. Good Guy. And the first thing they got to do is file a complaint. So the complainant has had to hire an attorney, right? Most of the time, if you go to a, an attorney and say, I fell and broke my leg, I want to sue my landlord. He turns around and looks on his computer and they find out you don't own anything, they're going to want a retainer. So 95% of the people that were suing anybody just got cut out of the pile because they don't have $5,000 to give them. But on some chance, an attorney said, yeah, I'll take it on, um, what do you call it? Yeah, I'll go pro bono on this thing. Then they're going to file a complaint. Well, the first thing they got to do is file it, which has got a fee. They got to write out a complaint, and then they got to serve you. Now, everything in the legal area, there's a timeline to it. So once a uh, complaint has been filed, there you have two years to find a defendant. Um, yeah, to serve them. So what if your defendant's in Alaska? How long is that going to take? So they've got two years to find you. So they're going to be pushed for time. They want to get that done just as quick as they can. Once that happens, the complaint has to be answered within 20 days, typically. In South Carolina, it's normally 20 days. So you've got 20 days to get that answer back in. And then you can start discovery. And discovery can go on for six months. And that's where you go in and start tearing everything apart and discovering everything you can about what's going on from both sides. They can depose people, dig into their financial statements, all those kinds of things. Ask about their job at work, talk to their lawyer that fixed or didn't fix their broken leg. Then you have interrogatories where you start the written questions and answers coming back. And then we start doing depositions where they actually come in and sit down and talk to an attorney and they ask them questions and they take that on the record. And then there are motions made before the court for dismissals or knocking out evidence or all those types of things. So do you see where we're going with this? This is a real time drag just to figure out what's going on with this house over here. Sounds expensive. It, it is expensive. And then you have mediation. You know, most attorneys want to settle things anyway instead of go to court. So mediation is going to be a big deal. And they're going to try to get this thing settled. Well, if you haven't done anything wrong, why would you want to mediate? So if you're not on public record, they don't have anything on you. Why would you just say, mm, let's keep going. <laughs> keep spending your money. And then you go to a trial. And then you would have a judge and a jury. Now, the players in all of the trial is kind of like a Broadway show. And this is no offense to our legal system or lawyers or any of that. But to me, a courtroom is kind of like a Broadway show. You have a courtroom, which is the stage. And then you have some actors, which are the lawyers. And they come in and they plead their cases for their defendant or their plaintiff. And they argue sometimes with very dramatic issues. And they show all these pictures. And they tug heartstrings. And they try to make you on their, get you on their side. And then there's a director which is the judge, and he tells people matters of law and what they can do and cannot do in the courtroom. And then you have the spectators, which is the audience. And then there's the score, which would be the verdict. Now, all of this that goes on in all those, that page there is all about cost, because you've got time for attorneys that are billing for all of their hours. You've got expert witnesses you might have to call in the time and the opportunity that you've lost by being involved in this lawsuit. So by doing all of that, let's go back to this now. This is the trust. And let's just say that you did all of these things and spent all of that money and found the right people to serve, and all of a sudden you were allowed to open up this trust and you found this guy. <laughs> That's J.D. Good Guy. <laughs> Told you he's a real guy, didn't I? <laughs> and he's the trustee. So this is who they're dealing with. We all know this guy. He's not the brightest 
That's on the block, okay? So there he is. And so once they spent all that money, they found him. And then they, now they get down to the question of, who owns this house? Well, in this, this is a trust. This is it. It's called the Native American Education Trust. It says so right there on the tab. And this is the trust. It's a declaration. Now, nobody else outside of this room will ever see this, especially if it's one of mine. They'll need a court order, subpoena, all that good stuff to get to this. But all the information, here's my management agreement. It says I'm now the manager. And, and also the trust has to pay me to do this. <clears throat> so if they were to get this guy to talk about this paperwork and get this in court and find out, you know what, who owns this thing anyway? Well, it's owned by the Katrina Refuge Care Trust. Well, damn. We just spent all that money and time. <laughs> Here we go. Again. And if they were so lucky enough <laughs> to run into another trustee. And this process just starts all over again. And so if they broke through that one, How long can we do this? You know how little these bags get? <laughs> I can make this go on forever. So, kind of to my point this, this morning we were talking about, oh, and just, just so I don't have wasted all this, we also have a, um, our as agent, Mary Livingwell. She's our agent. So anything that would happen to the property, she's the person to go out and see it. Now, in reality, this would be me. This is who the, the trust hired to go out and talk to these people as manager. But everything she does as a matter of law would be referred to as agent. So all the checks are made out to Mary Livingwell, or Tracy Mills, as agent. And then I can take that money and go put it in any bank account I need to. Or if they give me a check and I feel like, God, I don't know if that thing's good or not, I can go right down to the bank and cash it because it's made out to me. So I don't have to wait seven days to put it in my business account for it to hit and cause a $35 um, fee. I just go straight to the bank and I need you to cash this check for me. And they cash it. I do it all the time. Or if I have a business account or an LLC account as agent, I can go put it in any account that it needs to go into. So it gives you so much freedom with the money now that you can do anything you need to do. Does that make sense? Good. Um, so in this particular trust that I set up now, this is the first trust that shows up on record, the Native American Education Trust. And then it is owned by the Katrina, or at least the beneficiary of that is the Katrina Care Refugee Care Trust. So it flows, this is the house. It went into the Native American Education Trust, and then it flowed right down, is owned by this other person, property trust. And then, the beneficiary of that trust is the first choice, no, no, I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, the first, the Golden Asset Protection Trust is the beneficiary of that trust. Now, I know all this sounds confusing, But is that so hard? No, it's really not. It's, it's kind of like taking the money that, you know, when you go to pay for something to register and you hand them a 20, a 10, and a 5, and a 1? They just separate it and put it in the right drawer. And that's where it goes. So this stuff is not as complicated as it may sound. But the other thing I want to touch on here is this is the private and public line that you deal with on every property, guns, cars, everything. This is public record, and this is the private side of that. So once you put this first deed into a land trust and your original trustee, that, and then you assign the beneficiary, even if it was just going straight into you and you were the beneficiary, you would be under the private line. 
because it's not on public record. Now, I like to add as many layers as I can, as you see, where I've just put it into another land trust as the beneficiary. So it's just paperwork. It's just paper is really all it is. But it is a legal entity. So this just flows right into there. And I can do this all day long. I can even make this split off and start doing multiple trust splits. It's just how creative you want to be. Do I understand correctly on the trustee at the top of public for the first one? If I were to make that, say, very senior friend of mine, and they got it all set, everything was signed, and then they passed away, there's nothing that needs to be redone, right? No. I can just leave it in that, and then if they go looking for somebody, they're not there. That's exactly right. In fact, you could fire your trustee the moment you signed it. The, the um, agreement and you don't have to put that on public record now sometimes I will list all of my successor trustees on the deed because that keeps me from coming back and having to re-record something it just gets it all out on public record and and if I put it on there it's going to confuse them I, I've made my own rabbit trail mm -hmm. whereas if I don't put anything it, it's just um, how you decide you want to make this happen. You're in control here, so you get to play with all the parts and the members and get them to do whatever you want them to do. Do you have a legal, what's the word I'm looking for, um, duty to, if they all, to your example, passed on and you your you don't have a legal duty to post a trustee. Okay. Now, in, in the paperwork, most of the time, there is a place for a successor trustee. Mm -hmm. And I try to make sure I've got at least two or three, just in case something happens. So I don't have to, because where this could really show up is when you go to sign this land trust, so you sell it, mm -hmm. and you want to sign that deed, you got to prove that that person that signed it is now a trustee. So if it's on record, it's, it's, it's nothing that's debated. You just show up and go, they're the fifth trustee. All these people got fired. Okay. And so now this person is the trustee. Well, how do they know that you're the person to say that you fired them? Because you could show up with the paperwork then. Oh, you could okay. go to the closing attorney, and in confidence, you could just go in and, and, okay. and say, this is my list of successor trustees. This is how he got here. Okay. In, in trust, there's a form for everything. Right. Okay. So if you fire one, there's a form that says you fired them. But there's no and you put formality at stamps. Or you put that in the file. Okay. So that when you show up at closing. Nope. Is there a need for successor trustees? I mean, why not just fire them and then there isn't one? Can you do that? Well, somebody's got to sign the deed. So and if you're the beneficiary, though. you have to direct somebody. Now, you could come up as the beneficiary and appoint a trustee. But you've got to fill out a piece of paper that says, I appointed a brand new trustee. But until that time where you want to do something with it, the trustee really doesn't matter. And if they right. have passed on, you have right. no obligation to do a successor trustee right. if you went in there, right? Right. They can just go looking for somebody that doesn't exist anymore. Right. But if you died and didn't leave those instructions, you just created a mess. Oh, gotcha. okay. That's where and now you're going to probate. Okay. We want to avoid probate. Gotcha. They charge money to be in probate. So you mentioned earlier that the hardest part was, was creating the name of the trust for you and for then also the trustee. So me being an only child, I mean, I don't have anybody as a trustee. I mean, I've got two minor children. you got neighbors? <laughs> you don't have to like them. <laughs> I don't have to like them. No, you don't have to like them. But I mean, like, I have to, I mean, like. You do kind of want to have right, somebody. A you cordial, can, yeah. And, and and so, find somebody that you, can, you can communicate with. It could be a coworker, and say, look, I, I'd really be honored if you'd help me out with this. And I just need you to be a trustee for this trust I've created. And there's no obligation for you. I just need somebody to be able to sign papers when I need them to sign papers. That's it. You can also hire somebody to do it. They there, have like companies there is a land trust company in the state of Virginia. Now, this is really important, too. Wherever your trustee is where the domicile of your trust is. And all these states have different statutes. It's accepted in all states of the United States 
but some states are more progressive with it. Now, most of the trusts are referred to as an Illinois trust because that's kind of where they started in the United States, and that's where the most case law is. South Carolina has a little bit of case law, but they refer back to the Illinois case law when it ever comes to court. But Virginia has probably one of the best statutes for um, land trust cases. So there is a company in Virginia called the Virginia Land Trust Trustee Company. And that's all he does. He's trustee for land trust. I think he charges like three or four hundred bucks to set it up and a hundred dollars a year. And he does nothing. This little folder sits in his counter. Um, but but is he still an individual? He is an individual and mm -hmm. is domiciled mm -hmm. under Virginia, Virginia uh, statute. Okay. So when somebody comes looking for you, they know they got to go to Virginia to find this person. If if they find that out. Any other questions? I know that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I do have. Uh, is this recorded in the county in the name of the trust? Right, it is. It would be recorded. In fact, it shows up. Uh, the last one I did, my wife was actually the trustee. Oh, here's another great little strategy to do, too. Uh, most women have a maiden name, and most, we, most women have a middle name they don't <coughs> use. So my wife's name is Susan Lynn Grantham Mills. And she's gone by Susan G. Mills most of her time with, uh, when we were together. So my land trust trustee was Lynn Grantham. There's never been a Lynn Grantham record anywhere other than her birth certificate, and it wasn't even spelled out Lynn. So finding her is almost not gonna happen. Nobody knows where to look. So having wives with different maiden name or, or children with maiden names that have gotten married and moved off to another state, they're perfect because it's just gonna be a little bit harder. Now look guys, we're not trying to make things where you can go out and commit crimes and commit fraud and avoid prosecution. Most attorneys are, are going to want to get paid and that's what it's all about for them is getting paid. So that's going to keep the frivolous stuff from happening. If you've gone out and broken the law or you've defrauded somebody, the government is going to bear down on you and they have the resources to break these veils and to hunt you down in Alaska, Germany, wherever. They, they can find you. So this is not a bulletproof, I can go out and do whatever I want to do. This is just a way to survive all the stupidity that's going on in our world right now. And that's why I'm so vocal about it, is because I want you to be protected and survive all this mess. Yes, sir, do you have any? Yeah, I mean, what, what if you sort of like uh, uh, just look at the um, chain of records in, in your deeds and you find out that you initially personally owned that property and then transferred it. That could be a telltale if you do it that way. <coughs> now the way I do it is first of all, I'm going to have the homeowner to put this thing in land trust before they sell it to me. For estate planning purposes, that's a very important word or group of words. For estate planning purposes, I would write that down because that's what a land trust is all about. It's for estate planning purposes. So once they do that, there is no chain. It just, that's it. The homeowner had it, they put it in a land trust, and then all of a sudden, it's still there. And so they would assign that beneficial interest over to me for whatever amount of money or consideration that we came up with as a negotiated amount. And then I would move into the owner's position of that as the beneficiary of that trust. Would I want a separate trustee for each trust? You would. As he went down? Yeah. Because okay. if this was ever broken, you don't want him to go. We know who this guy is. And you also don't want to name your trust the same way. Like you don't want to say the blue 304 Stanley house, and then the next house is a blue whatever address. You don't want to cause a pattern. Because all you got to do is get on public record and type in a keyword, and wham, they all come up. Look up the word trust, and you'll see every one of them. So it has to have the word trust in it? Is it that will, yes, thing? they'll put that in it. Why couldn't you make, uh, my brain's going here, why couldn't you make yourself a trustee and have the beneficiary as yep. your company? Why now you you're on public you? record, and you're also a dual yeah, but what would it matter? Because I have no interest in it, right? No, you do as a trustee. You are the legal owner. Okay. 
Okay, you don't want so, to so if, if Kramer gets sued, then I lose my house? Because he got sued. <laughs> Kramer doesn't know a thing that's going on. Okay. Delay, well, delay, that's all the delay, 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 <laughs> delay, 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 delay. Okay. okay, that's really what this is going to cause. Um, if it ever came down to... But if he got in personal trouble... He's just a trustee. He has no attachment. Well, then that's what I'm saying. So why but you're, a dual, you're doing dual purposes there. No, that's what I was saying. If I was trustee and I had my business as beneficiary... He's just the manager, right? It's just yeah, the manager. you could be the manager. I just wouldn't go on public record as the trustee because they're going to put it together. Yeah. You're just leaving a clue for no reason. Yeah, you're, you're just throwing that right out there for them to, to start wondering. I mean, they're just going to hound you, actually. I, I would never put myself on as trustee. Only one condition would I do that, and that's if it was a bank account. Okay. And you don't even have to do it then. You just got to know somebody that you can trust to be the trustee of your bank account. <laughs> but the key is also when you have a tenant, not to ever in any way, shape, or form let them know you have ownership in it. Even if it's just conversational. Yes. And, and that's hard to do in the very it's beginning. It's hard to do because it's that mindset. Right. In the very beginning, they're going to challenge you on, well, I don't have to pay rent. When you're going to say, because I put you in here and I, this is my house. I work hard for this house. That will happen to you. You have to you have to change your entire mindset and go. Oh no, man! I'm the manager, but I really like to keep my job. And these guys want to get paid, and I'm gonna tell you, if they don't pay, they're gonna go ahead and go to court and get you out. Because the first thing you're gonna do is, if you put this in a land trust, you're gonna show back up and go, Hey guys, I got some new paperwork. I need y'all to sign. Uh, I've sold the property, and uh, you don't have to ask their permission to get out of their old lease agreement and take all that stuff away. You come into this new one with the trust. And so I just need you guys to sign this new paperwork, and they're usually they're going to sign it. And then all of a sudden, you're just the manager anymore. Now, when you mentioned, now I know you said there's you have, you need a different trustee for each one, and you're the beneficiary all the way at the bottom, and you're the manager. You can name yourself manager. You can be the manager of every one of them. Okay, that was my question. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do that. I'm just a management company, man. These yeah. people hired me. They all hired me together. Okay. Yeah. That way you stay in right in the middle of everything. You have questions? Yeah, ultimately, um, it's going to slow people down. But if somebody makes a concerted effort and spends money, yeah, if they got some money to spend, they, 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 they can eventually get to you. Um, and if they're going to spend that money, you probably did something wrong. This yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think is not in one hundred percent bulletproof. Right, it's impossible. If you got a, a badass uh, lawyer over there, they will find you one way or another. I mean, but we make sure that we hide ourselves as much as we can, you know, and uh, land trust is one of the best tools out there. If but you do uh, all of this and they find you, um, they're, com you they're committed and, and you, you probably, you did something wrong, I'm telling you, because <laughs> you, this is going to shake anybody. Nobody's going to put this effort. I mean, you're looking at probably $50,000 to get to here in about two years of your life. So who, who's going to do that over a um, personal injury claim unless they're going to get millions and millions? I mean, it's just it's not going to be worth it. So they're going to bail out very quickly. Where does a liability insurance policy come into play? The trust owns the liability as well as everything else. All the insurance is in the name of the trust. But, it, but you're not saying go without a liability policy. Right, no, not at all. You're going, to, you're going to still have the same insurance coverage that you did if your name was on this. It's just now covering the trust. Yeah, so this would, so this would start, like they wouldn't even mess with the trust at all until after they had sued your insurance company, right? Right. Yeah. Well, lawyers like to put everybody on the paperwork. So you probably would get named as a defendant, but the trust would and the trustee. But that they're really going after the insurance company. If they get what they're looking for, they're going to leave. Will this protect against, like, say, an aging parent who a nursing home wants to go after the home? Yes, it will. If you could go ahead and get this in done now, I think, what, Medicaid has a two-year look back? Or a seven-year? I can't remember. That was my next question. Was what, how, that, yeah. how so so this has come out of their name. They don't own this anymore. So if they need Medicaid... 
don't have anything. I'm going to shoot right through. And you've kept everything in place. Seven years. I think it is seven years. They can look back as to what you've sold or done with the property. And they're serious about it, too. <laughs> we'll go after what if stuff. it's sold? Then it's sold. It's That's right. If it's not in your name, it's not in your name. So you can't, get, go you can't get, get something that you don't have. Right. So if it's moved into a land trust and that elderly parent is not the beneficiary nor the... Even if they are the beneficiary, it does not matter. They don't own they it. Don't, right, because that Medicaid doesn't know that they're it's, the beneficiary. It's not on public record. So they can actually be the beneficiary. Got it. Nothing has to change. <laughs> So if you move it into the trust, like let's say it's an elderly parent, who pays like the property taxes? The trust around? would. The trust pays Yeah, the trust is going to get a bill just like the owner would. So they build a trust essentially rather than the individual. That's exactly the trust right. The be going to have the same function of the a normal LLC, but it's not an LLC, it's a trust. So the trust would have the same 6% tax, property tax, would be the same thing. Actually, there's a way around that. <laughs> that was one question that I want to ask. But anyways, so the it's the same way that you have an LLC, but it's a trust. You know, so it is the same function of LLC. If you have a proper management or whatever, you know, it's the same function that a trust will do. It's right. The same thing. You want to open a bank account? No, bank don't account. open a bank account for every trust. No. You can operate this out of your personal bank account. Is there a reason why you would want to do it that way? You would want to do it just out of your personal? If you've got more than two of these things, you probably want to open a management account. Yeah, just to go along with your property management position. But if you're just doing one or two of these things, you can run it right through your normal account. Yes. So if you get a trustee that's, let's say, he's my neighbor, and I say, hey, can you help mm -hmm. me out do this? And then something happens, and they come to the trustee, goes, oh, yeah, my neighbor over here, Sarah, she's the one that had me sign all this stuff. Well, like, aren't they just right to me anyway? That can happen, and you can also get proper out of your name before they can get over in your yard. I don't know. <laughs> Prove it. Prove it. And then we go back to this long page. <laughs> I mean, folks, right. that's what it's designed for. Use it. Don't let the lawyers do all the winning on this thing. Does all that need to be notarized, or is it just that? There are some notary okay. acknowledgments on some of this stuff, especially the deeds and a couple of other the things. The notary is just to make sure that you sign that paper. Mm -hmm. They're not going to read no, every single paragraph. That's exactly right. They're not going to read it. No. They just want their $3, <laughs> and they'll sign it. As long as you know you got your ID and all that. <laughs> yeah, there are some notary acknowledgments. So if somebody comes back and does a, goes after the trustee, would I be notified at that point because I'm like the beneficiary of the land trust? So I would know what's going on before it got. Anywhere. They would call you. Who would call you? The trustee. The trustee. Oh, okay. If the trustee got served or got a phone call, now you can write into these things that if the trustee gets a phone call or get surge papers, they're immediately fired. <laughs> now, if you've got that kind of, I mean, if you're, you're that paranoid or think you're going to have a problem, you write that into the trust. And so immediately they go, well, I'm not the trustee anymore. <laughs> so I'm done. I don't know what else to tell you. And I'm not under any kind of oath to tell you anything now. Yes, sir. Um, how is... How are trusts taxed? I mean, so if they buy it's a pass-through, so it's just like regular income for you. Okay. The trust doesn't get taxed; you get taxed. But does, does that mean all the money has to pass through? Or say I buy land for a million, sell it for a million and a half, IRS is probably going to want some of that. How if you do a sale like you normally would, but if you sold them the uh, beneficial interest of the land trust, would be personal property. So that five hundred thousand, nobody needs to know about. There's no like cost basis. Yeah. No. This is another way to get around the realtor issue. Yeah, you sold in the trust, not the land. That's right. Yeah. We're in a whole different court system. It's a whole different wow. everything. Yeah. Personal property. What do you mean to get around the realtor issue? Okay, as a as a unlicensed realtor, I can't take you and that person and put y'all together and make a sale. But if I went to him and put it in a land trust, now I can put you all together, let him sell you the beneficial interest, and I can get paid. 
where I can get in the middle of this thing. This thing, what I've talked about tonight is probably a day's conversation if I was to really break it down and slow down and show you each little piece. It's probably take a day to get it all out. So there's a lot to this stuff. But it's not complicated. We overcomplicate it because it's not what we've normally done in our normal course of business. But i got to tell you, once you start thinking this way, uh, this is the easier route. Because I can change, if I make a mistake, I can change it. That's me. I have a question. So usually you do a trust or will, that's what you hear, right? Like a, as a layman like me. So what is the difference? I guess a will is more, it stays in the name and then... Where are you going to get a trust from, an attorney? An attorney's going to write it up so he can bill you and charge you. And he's also going to put some stuff in there that you have to come back to him to get this will done, something done with, or the trust. He's got to be involved in it some way yeah. to get paid. It's not going to make any money. Guys, that's why lawyers don't know anything about these things. It doesn't make them any money. There's nowhere for them to make money in this. So they're not interested in it. They didn't study it. They don't want to study it. Any attorney that's ever closed any real estate for me, and this is not a I'm smarter than them, I've had to teach them about land trust because it's not making them any money. It's not something they're concerned with. So they really just didn't even know this existed. So do you have one land trust for each property? And I was getting ready to say, you don't have to do it this way. You could put yourself as the beneficiary right there and end it. All, that's all the paperwork you need. And nobody would probably ever know it. Because they're not going to break this veil typically. But if you're a little bit paranoid <laughs> or you lack a little buffer zone, this helps. This helps you sleep at night. But the buffer zone is just one more piece of paper. It's one more little bag is how I think about it. <laughs> you know? We can fight for years to get this thing opened up, and when you get it opened up and think, we got him now, here we go again. And that's another trust. And that's another trust. Right. And I can do this all day. In fact, I can keep putting them in there while you're opening them up. That seems a little excessive, to be honest. What, but three I'm, of them? Yeah. It probably could be, but what if you had a $2 million piece of property okay. with a water park in it and a pond? And, I'm not um, rolling like that, so I think I'm going to If you get into real estate enough, you're going to run up on something. What if you bought a racetrack? <laughs> yeah. You think there's a little bit of liability there? <laughs> if I own a racetrack, these things would start off as boxes like this. <laughs> and we'd be down to a little card that you put gift cards in by the time I got done. <laughs> with room to add more. Um, I'll be honest with you, the way I do this is I do one, two, and this is my living trust. Right here where all of my stuff accumulates. So if you want to go after me, there's where you go, but you're never going to find me. I promise. <clears throat> Say I create that, that buffer zone, and I'm the best beneficiary all the way at the bottom because you have to be at least 18, right? So Not for a beneficiary, as a trustee. Okay, so a beneficiary can be somebody who's not born yet. <laughs> okay. You can skip a generation. You talk about straightening your kids out. <laughs> <laughs> now you can skip a generation or four and um, make them the beneficiaries of this. And then watch the parents go, but we can't get in it. So your IRA can be the owner of the trust? <coughs> your IRA can, yes. And receive all the proceeds. So what if this was paid for? It was just a rental. My mobile home that was collecting 800 bucks a rent a month, and you passed away. Now, you could do the same thing with an IRA, but it's on record. Right there. I see it all the time. For the benefit of. Who's the first thing you're going to sue? The government can't take it, but it can be sued for damages. So this just creates all those layers in there. You don't want them to get this. We'll ask about the taxes, and you said <coughs> about the taxes on the property. Six percent oh, of property taxes. Yeah, this is a little trick you can do. So you just put this in a. You find a nice little couple that wants to move into this house, and you get their driver's license that has that address on it. And what else is it that you have to have for your electric bill? Yeah, you know, maybe an electric bill, and you write them out a land contract. Two weeks couple of days, a year, whatever you want to do, they go down to the county and pay the taxes at 4%. If it stays in this trust, the county is very likely never going to catch on. 
because there's been no transfer, no anything. They're not recording it. It just stays like this for eternity until somebody shows up to the county and goes, I want to record a document on this. So once you get the 4%, you're very likely not going to lose it unless you self-report. Right, so if, if something is currently in 4% and then it moves into the, to the trust. trust. It's probably going to stay there. Because there's no alarms going off in the county. See, when you move renters in and out of there and they got people coming in and out and they're mailing your tax notice to a different address, there's alarms going off and they pick up on all that stuff. But if this thing, is the, the land trust is going to the same post office box or your house or wherever the whole time, they're probably never going to have an alarm go off. They're just going to keep sending the bills. No, I mean, like, if my mother owns a condo and then it goes into the land trust and then the land trust, then the address goes to me, mm -hmm. if I'm the beneficiary, then, that, then that's a change of address. Wherever this land trust, see, the land trust is going to have a, a trustee, at a trust address. Right. So you want to establish that as to wherever you're going to be for a while. Especially a PO box. PO box is great. Right. And if it just stays there, it's probably not going to trigger anything for them to go, wow, we need to go up on the... Taxes. So far, that's been my experience. Okay. I've not had one go up yet. Okay. Which is a big deal. For the whole legal protection, I mean, why not simply go with an LLC structure? I mean, well, the first thing is you just went on public record with an LLC. Right, yes. There's your clue. Yeah, they still cannot easily break the corporate bail. That depends on a few things. If you're the uh, beneficiary of the LLC and you run the LLC and you don't keep good records, they're coming straight in. Attorneys love LLCs. That's why they want you to get one, so they can break it. Because most of us, me being one of them, I don't do everything that I'm supposed to do every year with an LLC. There's requirements from the state. You have to stay at arm's length on some of this stuff, and we don't. We don't keep great records. So when you show up in court, the first thing the attorney does is jump right on that, and they'll, they'll pierce that veil. And then you're exposed like you never had one. Public record is not a good thing anymore. Used to, you had to know where to go look for it. So everybody didn't just jump into it. Now, it's everywhere. It, sh it pops up in your email. Somebody moves in a house, they send everybody around them an email that says who moved in and what they do for a living. That LLC all the way at the bottom of the buffer zone. Can that LLC still operate in the public sphere? Oh, absolutely. Stay down there. Absolutely. And yeah. Okay. It would be no different than putting your name there. Okay. Which that's where my name is, is at the bottom of this. You know, in, in, in the information that's within this. But um, but yeah, your LLC could come in there that way. If they ever made it that far, they still got one more to go. Gotcha. And you, so you could have properties in that LLC, and then just. Say, oh, I'm going to quit putting my properties in an LLC. I'll just do it. And, and you can have one LLC for 100 properties. Yeah. They can all be that bottom tier. You know? I mean, if they make it that far, they found a goodie jar. Yeah. <laughs> but all you got to do is write another one right here and write another one right there. You just keep them chasing. Make them spend some money. What this does is put you in control. Now, instead of hunt, you know, being so concerned about I, the court system's got me, they don't have you to hear. You have them. So how do we write, how do we create a trust? Well, there are a lot of people out there, look on the internet, people who sell trust paperwork, um, and they sell courses for that all the time. I, I can help you with things, but I can't do it for you. I, I'd be practicing law without a license, and I'm not going to do it. Um, most of my paperwork is copyrighted, so it's not something I can just share outward. What I have done in the past, um, and listen carefully, <laughs> what I have done in the past is I can joint venture with you on something. I'll bring the trust. I can get everything set up, everything running, and you buy me out. I'm going to step back out. And all it takes is assignment and quick claim of beneficial interest, and you're going away. It's not on public record, but it's all legal, and I didn't break the law. Because the last thing you want to do is have somebody chasing you for breaking something, especially practicing law without a license. They'll, they'll get you for that. 
So you just have to be careful. Say my parents create a trust mm -hmm. and my mom inherits money. Will it just immediately go into the trust? A trust is only what the asset of that trust is. So if you assign that asset, if you went back into the trust and said, oh, oh by the way, it also owns this amount of money that was inherited. Even if it came in houses and cars and money. Whatever it is, it has to be listed as an asset. So a land trust without an as asset is a piece of air. There's nothing there. There has to be an asset in it for it to exist. So yes, you could just keep, in fact, on most of my trust sheets, there's a bottom sheet that tells you all the exhibit A's and B's that you can put in there and you just keep adding. I know on my living trust, every time I buy a property, it, that gets put in there. Because that's where it all settles. So is there like an ongoing expense with a trust? You know, like a, once you record, you know, once you record the deed, unless you have to do some kind of recording, that's it. You're done. There's no fees. There's so nobody to report to. A copyright holder, or like an mm -hmm. or something. They just can't give away or sell their stuff. What about these companies on the internet that, that are trying to sell you setting up a trust? Well, they're selling their material, which they have a license to do. And, and I would tell you, if you bought something like that online, have it checked out by an attorney. Just take it to them and go, look, here's this land trust I'm thinking about using. Can you look and make sure I'm meeting? All they're going to tell you is you're meeting all the statutes of South Carolina law. Like, and one big kicker is South Carolina has its own notary acknowledgement. It's different from some other states. So you want to make sure you got the right notary acknowledgement. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure the lawyer that you're going to find out, they know the land trust. If you start asking questions, they kind of tremble around, go to somebody else. Yeah. Because not every single lawyer knows about that. And it's not because they're stupid. It's just because that doesn't make them any money and they don't care. So don't, don't think that they're, they don't know what the law. They do. They just don't. This, this doesn't make them any money. And as you can see, there's no expense in this. Where would they make a dime on this? I mean, would you pay them? I wouldn't. Life is something I could type up myself. Now, I, I type mine, but you can handwrite these on, on the fly. You can do this on the trunk of a car. So it's not some formal thing, but the recorder has to be able to read it. <laughs> That's the only thing. So you to, uh, expound on what the lady in the back said. Um, you can keep adding. You don't after. You can add assets. Can, but can you take away assets? Sure. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't empty it out. As long as you have something. It in has there. to be an asset in there. Okay. For it to exist. Okay. Can you put liabilities in it? Yes, like a gun? Absolutely. It's the best place for a liability like that. It's in a trust all by itself, and your name's not attached to it. But you have access to it. You can use it to kill people with or shoot murders or whatever. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> you could use it to defend yourself. <laughs> yeah. For like estate planning purposes only. <laughs> <laughs> For estate protection purposes only. Yeah. Yeah. Estate protection. <laughs> if you have somebody who's a drunk, put their little property, put the car in a land trust. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Keep you out of a little bit of trouble. That's no. a joke. You can put what's a car in a land trust? What's the difference between that? Sorry, a land trust, a personal property trust, and then a oh, yeah. trust. So a land trust is attached to a piece of property. <coughs> Real, Real estate. Real estate. Whereas a personal property trust is everything else. Money, stocks, rings, artwork, uh, CDs, all those type of things. But real estate becomes a personal property once it goes into a land trust. Is there another type of trust that you could put into uh, real estate into also? And here's the reason why I ask. Um, uh, an attorney spoke at our meeting back in the spring, and he spoke about trust for about a minute and a half, I think. And um, I don't really understand the context of what he was saying, but he said, don't use a land trust. It's different, Dave. 
Okay. It's different kind of lake trust. I, I okay. have experience on that one that you said okay. because I got to mess up on that one. Okay. So, so I it's, don't, that, it's kind of different. Okay. Yeah. So I don't even know what I, uh, I'm just repeating what I heard. I don't even know what it is I'm saying. So, yeah, <laughs> that, so you know. yeah. Well, yeah. Th these are called land trusts because this is the, now, now this <coughs> is 500 years old. This overrides state and federal statutes because it was here before our government was in place. That's why you call it a land trust. If you call it something else, now you fall back down into the statutes of current law. So this is old English law. This goes back to um, Caesar. I think that was kind of the first place it actually showed up in history. When he would get ready to go off to battle, he would put all his properties and valuables in the hands of a trustee that would watch out for him until he returned. And if he didn't return, they knew what to do with his property. So it's kind of where this got started. And then it just kind of grew on from there. So so this, this law is standing above United States law. So is there, is there any effort to dismantle this? Or is there, I mean, I, I've, certainly I've been investing for five or six years and don't, I haven't really heard of this, so this is new, but uh, it, 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 at some point is... Um, we live in a crazy even, society right now. Well, it doesn't even come up on the radar about no. these types of things. So. Right. But you would think like a lot of uh, political political hot topics, you would think like, oh, well, let's tax the billionaires. You're hearing all this rhetoric out there. And, um, so, but let's get rid of the land trust. That's the thing. You all know. the people that make the laws have these yeah, things. Yeah, they have yeah. these. Yeah. Every they senator has know. these things. Why do you think every time some senator gets on TV trashing somebody else, they don't show up and go, you're a property owner and you own 8,000 pieces of property? Because he doesn't own 8,000 pieces of property. He just gets the avails and proceeds from all those properties. They're smart. And then once again on uh, income taxes, are you, well, would you or could you or do you not have to file as though it's a Schedule yeah. E or whatever? Yes, you do. You okay, would so you're this. doing all that. You're doing all the compliance. Right. You put all of your properties. I wouldn't take, like if you own 10 properties, I wouldn't break each of them down. I would just put all my properties together and say this is depreciation for this list of properties. Because then you just identified yourself on your taxes. But if you put all your real estate holdings, and this was your deductions, and this was your in, in, your expenses, they don't know what you have. What was that last part? So you, you're saying don't list out all the properties, mm -hmm. just I, put I, a lot I, of my number. I put my real estate holdings okay. on my Schedule E. Now, you want to have this so that if you get audited, you can show where this depreciation came from and that depreciation and this income. You want to show that, but you're not going to put it on your taxes that way. Has this been a help? Is there something I can do different to help convey this? Because I tell you what, I talk about this stuff a lot, and I have a lot of people going, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, for one, you said there's three, personal property, uh, land trusts for real estate, and what was the third one? Probably living trust. The living trust. Yeah. Yeah, can you come back and do a seminar on each one of those? Now, <laughs> there, now there are a ton of trusts out there. The best I've found out is a spendthrift trust. Oh That's what God. the Kennedys and the Rockefellers use. And all they do is put taxes off until the end of time. And the last guy that's in that family, after he's dead for 21 years, taxes come due. <laughs> wow. One day I'm going to graduate to a spendthrift. But they're expensive. One last, yes, last question, please. Um, when, so when there, when you hear that there's a property and earth, uh, earth conflict, and like, let's say there's, I mean, that's a lot in Charleston here, like a mountain or whatever. So no one can sell it because no one knows, like, kind of, is that what what's going on behind the scenes, basically? When Could they be. call it, so they don't know who the owner is. Yeah. A smart guy would do that. So that's that that thing, probably. Yeah, probably so. And you know what? I see land trusts all the time. And I write land trusts and still have problems finding them. Now, if they're, if they're not smart and they put their cell phone there or they use their kid and they use their kid's full name, I can find them quick. And it's kind of fun to find them. I, and I'm not really trying to sue them, but it's fun to go, ah, oh, I found you. <laughs> but, um, and, and it also educates you on what not to do. Put your son's first name right. and last name right. if he's a junior. Okay? 
one of you going to get served. <laughs> um, be a little more creative. Use initials. Uh, hunt for people that have weird names. I do. When, I, when people introduce themselves, if it's got a ski on the end of it, and this is not a racist thing, but there's a lot of skis everywhere. And so I'm like, I, yeah, you, I would be honored if you'd be my trustee. <laughs> William Smith, I'm after him. So is there a place, uh, a market for people that are selling trusted properties, properties that are in trust? Most people don't know to do that. In fact, i got to tell you, I just re-woke myself up for it. I forgot about it. So is that a yes another, or a no? <laughs> no, there's not. There's okay. not a market for it. Okay. You, you'll never hear about it because if you heard about it, that means it's on, on record now. You'll never know. Well, no, I'm saying, because you said, I'm assuming you were imply, implying. Maybe, that maybe this is your question. The capital gain. Sorry. Maybe this is your question. Is there somebody who would like to buy a piece of property and not go on public record? A convicted felon, somebody through a divorce, the IRS is hunting you. They would love to buy an owner financed house, beneficial interest of a land trust. Big market. So where is that market? Advertising, they will come. They're on Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you put a, first of all, put on their owner financing. That's all that that'll take care of it right there and they'll start showing up and then you just start talking to them and when they're kicking the ground like this while they're talking to you, there's something wrong. <laughs> just ask them, man, how are your taxes? <laughs> well I work for myself and I got an IRS lien. I can help you. You take ten thousand extra down, but I can help you. There's a lot of benefit to that. There's a big market for that that type. Okay. Divorce situations? Yeah. But I think also a lot of people are maybe used for that because they don't know what they get into. Right. The hardest the thing about selling a piece of property, selling the beneficial interest, is people don't know what they're buying with right. a trust. They go, I don't know what I'm buying. Well, I can educate you real quick, and guess what? I'll be your trustee. How about that? What would a new, and a new deed would be filed? No. No, because you're selling them the trust. You're selling them the interest in, in the, trust. the trust. All they get to do is now they get to hold the whole, hold the folder. That's really it. So you give them the folder, but then the trustee would change, right? Mm, Possibly. Don't have to. You could keep the same trustee. Okay. <coughs> now, these are those alarms we're talking about with the 4 to 6% tax. You start switching all that stuff around on public record, that right. could kick off some stuff. Well, you have to record it somewhere, so you record it in that yeah, folder. Yeah, you do it in here. Right, right. In yeah. that. So they would have a copy of that. And Don't ever give your trustee the paperwork. No, the, you say bought it. The buyer, you would, right? Yeah, because you're yeah. selling this. That's what you're selling. Yeah, if you were buying beneficial interest, I'm going to give you this folder. Right. And okay. everything that's in it. Okay. Would you like to keep a copy for yourself, just to read the records? You you, it would probably be a good business model to keep it, um, but now also you're liable for it, too. Because if you have to swear under oath, about your knowledge of it. I don't have any knowledge of that. I don't have any of those documents anymore. I sold the interest in that. And once you don't have it anymore, anything could have happened in that folder Absolutely. and you wouldn't know. Absolutely. So you can honestly you say you have no idea that. what's in that folder Absolutely. because they could have changed all of it since you saw it last. Right. Put you in control. So when you sell it, it's good to get that notarized just to oh, break yeah. the chain. Oh yeah. Even if you just did a bill of sale, we'll go along with it. Promissory notes. Owner financing were great to get rid of these things. Now you still got an attachment. What if you had to take it back? Well, that's what you said because you said you would be their trustee. So right. you would have I, I, to, I would be glad to be their trustee. You would have to change that on the recorded thing, though, right? On the public record. Mm -hmm. Just fire that one. They appoint me. And they're they gotta, they gotta sell it again. If they gotta sell it. They don't know what to do. Right. Call you back. That's pretty well what's going to happen. They're going, what are they doing? But I will tell you this. Most lawyers, if you took this to them and said, somehow I own this piece of property, <laughs> they can look through this thing and go, all right, we got it now. Okay. Yeah, we, we get it. All right. They might make a boo-boo or two here and there, but it's nothing. I haven't had a problem transferring title once the, well, the process was set up and running. I can usually get it done on, with any lawyer. 
It's just a setting up they don't understand. When you have it set up so that if somebody comes and serves your trustee, they found your trustee, now in the clause, in the verbiage somewhere in there, it says now he's now fired and not trustee. Do you have to have a, like a another clause saying some, so and so is appointed temporary trustee at this point? The way mine are set up is there is a successor trustee already listed. Oh, yeah, you did say that. Yeah, and I can do that all day long. I can set up 20 of them to keep following him. So if I think I'm going to turn some over, you can do that. You can go and add one at any time and reappoint one. There's there's paperwork. I mean, you can draw this paperwork out of the top of your head and go, I need to appoint a new trustee. Okay, let's draw up an appointment of trustee. It's not complicated. It's not a lot of legalese. I now appoint you the trustee of such and such a trust, dated on such a date, blah, blah, blah. That's about it. And that does not go on public record? No, it doesn't. How many documents need to be recorded? On the trust, on the on the trust. I do three. The stop block that I'm talking about to keep your trustee from going rogue. If this guy is your trustee and he's had a little bit too much to drink, or he owes the bookie, and he decides he wants to put your property up, you record an affidavit of memorandum of purchase and sale agreement on public record, and that stops everything until you sign saying you release that affidavit. Now, all it states is you put in a purchase and sale agreement on that piece of property and you're ready to close. That's all it says. And you get those anywhere. Is that kind of like putting a cloud on a title? It clouds the title permanently. And I know of a case I'm consulting on in Texas right now where a wholesaler went in and Put one of those affidavits on it, and now he's holding the people hostage because he wants thirty thousand dollars to take it off. And he's just crooked. He never intended on buying that house, but he's holding this old lady's property up over an affidavit, so it works. It will stop a sale. He had no more. What did you call that one? Affidavit, affidavit of memorandum for purchase and sale agreement, and they also make one for options. Like if you do an option on the property, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, so if you're going to buy like a rental property, right, and you want the seller to put it in a trust, so your name's never on it and you do it that way, what do you tell the seller, or how, how do you explain to them, how do you, yeah, the way yeah, I what do you tell it, them? As I would come in and say, if you're getting ready to sell this property, I need you to do something for me because I don't want to be on public record. I'm going to have you put this in, in a land trust right before you sign your documents. Okay. It's instantaneous. Okay, I'm assuming at the closing table would be like, yeah, based she's on not, the document. He or she's not going to care. Right. Okay. They say sign here, sign here. Right. You can just tell your attorney, put this in the stack and put sign here right there. Yeah. Gotcha. They won't even know they did People it. People don't read contracts. No, they don't. No, yeah, no, you just sign But now, I would tell them. I, I, would, I would tell them, look, I placed this thing in a, in a land trust, and that's, just a, that's how I'm going to buy it is in your land trust. For estate planning purposes. For estate planning purposes. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. Uh, I'm the management, so you're the manager of your rental properties. Does that require you have a license? No, it doesn't because you don't need it. You get your check you Well, I mean, you're a third party entity. Yeah, I'm sorry. You guys are saying you're not a private person anymore, so how does that. Well, you don't, I'm telling you, you don't need it. Well, all right. I mean, I you've been appointed to manage, it would be no different than. You're not working for people going out and, and recruiting them to hire you. They just hired you. They just said, hey, buddy, I want you to take care of my property. By the way, we're going to pay you to do it. I mean, you can do that. Now, if you go out soliciting people, and you take on all this liability, yeah, that's a different story. Right? Answering everybody's questions for now? Well, there was one thing that we talked about earlier today that I thought would be worth bringing up, which was how to make sure that if you pass away unexpectedly, your heirs can, you know, find all your stuff. Well, you want to keep these folders in a safe place with good instructions. Keep up with your paperwork. That's going to be real important in a trust. It's not hard, but you do have to fill out all your paperwork at one time and make sure you covered your bases. If you change something, put a note in the file so you'll remember. Because you start doing 15 or 20 of these things and you start naming them stuff, you won't even know which one you're talking about. 
And I have to do that sometimes. I have to look back and go, what trust is that name in? Especially if you start doing stacking. So if you don't have a lot of properties and a lot of money, just do your beneficiary of this one. That'll work. Yeah, so like, write some instructions down for whoever your beneficiary is so that they can find it is all you need to do. Yeah, be in touch with them. Don't just surprise them with a whole bunch of folders. They go, I don't know what this stuff is. My children, if I start, if I say the word trust, they go to sleep. <laughs> Daddy, please, God, don't talk about trust again. And I'm sure y'all probably do that way sometimes, too. <laughs> yes, um, question about um, capital gain when you sell the land trust. Yeah, if you do it on record or if you do it in the conventional way, you're going to pay capital gains. But if you sold it as personal property and you did it as a beneficiary, you, you sold the beneficial interest, there really are no capital gains. It's personal property. Took the capital right out of it. Even if they bought it with a mortgage, now you have some type of track in because of the mortgage company buying the house. So how do you get around that? In other words, I went to the bank and borrowed money and I put this in a trust and the trustee signed the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, you're on record for the, the trustee's on record. That's why you don't want to be the trustee. But then when you sell it, if you sell it... The trustee's going to gonna sell it. Okay. You're down here. So it's still on record as a sale because sure. the mortgage... But the trust it sold it and the trustee sold it. You didn't sell it personally. So the trustee is taxed? No, the trustee has no tax. The tax is going to flow through on your taxes. But to me, that just sounds like the IRS is going to say, well, here's what your intent was. You can see what you did, and that sounds nice. The IRS recognizes land trust as a pass-through trust. So everything, you're talking about selling the beneficial interest? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're going to get upset with that? It's their laws. Personal property trust, they don't tax that way. If you sell your car, that's a different story. If you sell all the bushes around your house. So even though there's a record of the sale because of the mortgage, you still don't have to claim the gain. No, you're going to have to claim the gains if you sold it on the public record. That's the difference. If I'm selling the beneficial interest, nothing above this line changes. There's only a piece of paper involved. But if you sell that more, if you sell that piece of property and those people go get a new mortgage, all that's happened above here. So yes, you're gonna pay taxes on that. Now, I'm not trying to tell you not to ever pay taxes on it, but this is a way that you can keep some money in your pocket. Maybe. You would do this like if I'm paying taxes good. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it all, and pass all it all on. Yeah. Maybe we'll do one more question. If somebody has one. And I know that was fast, as a lot to cover in a short amount of time. But I wanted to get you indoctrinated into the book. Thank you. I'd like to give a hand to Trey. Now, I highly recommend you guys to come and talk to Tracy. And uh, if you guys have any other questions, he'll be glad to answer. But uh, get a knowledge about this, uh, this topic because it will, really will save money. Have been saving money to me uh, and peace of mind. Uh, I used to own apartment complexes and all my apartment complexes was on a trust, but I had to hire a lawyer to do it because I was a bigger problem. And he's right, if, if you have a property that is, on, that is um, value over a million dollars, you will really want to be protect yourself. Um, so get with him and uh, he'll teach you a lot. So everybody like um, what you heard today? Yeah, All right, just to remind you all, the next meeting will be in the new place, which will be the second Tuesday of December. All right, so it'll be our Christmas party. And uh, pretty sure you guys are going to love what you guys want to see. And it's going to be a nice barbecue, and, then, so if you, and I guess Santa will Santa will do it. The um, will be dressed like a his um, Santa Claus thing. <laughs> but if you wanna, I mean, we do this every single year. If you wanna donate a, a toy for um, the Santa um, for Toys for Clothes, not Toys for Clothes.
want to donate a toy, bring a toy, and and uh, and uh, he'll give Please you some. Don't wrap it. Just bring it. That way, if my uh, warehouse elf can put it in a fryer, all the patrons should be able to give out the gift. And we do food, we do whatever. And One more thing. I don't have a card, but I'll give you my name, telephone number, and email address. So my name is Tracy Bills. My phone number is 803-223-9756. And my email address is tracy5963 at gmail.com. Say your telephone number again, please. 803-223-9756. And if I don't answer the phone, I probably won't answer the phone. Just leave me a quick message, and I'll call you back just as quick as I can. We established that this morning. Huh? We established that this morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't stop for a lot. Can you repeat the email, please? T-R-A-C-Y, Tracy, 5963 at gmail.com. So I recommend you guys to stay around and, and uh, network a little bit. We have probably 20 more minutes so we can talk. And uh, some of us are going to put the, um, the room together like it was and uh, just stay around and know each other. Thanks, guys. Thank you.